Hello everyone. I've kept working at my destruction and I've got it uh, working a lot more smoothly than it had been. I've been shooting for about 60 FPS on the whole thing and yeah, that's that's where I have got this. Instead of using physics, I'm actually sending the instant static mesh data to Niagara and simulating some particles with it. And they, you know, they aren't perfect, but when they're all moving at once, you can't really tell. And I've also taken the chance to add a little extra destruction to uh, be a bit of a stress test on this whole thing, and it's all pretty darned satisfying. You can just blow major holes in this building. But, um, despite all of this uh, feeling pretty smooth, the big problem I've run into is what happens when I want to take this entire thing down? Well, I've created a function to destroy this building as fast as I can without having a major impact on performance, and this is it. Each individual little section is getting destroyed pretty fast, but there's so many sections that it just takes a long time to destroy a building like this. And that tells me that this might be good uh, a good destruction technique for something short, like you know walls like this. But for a building, I'm going to need to build a better batching system, probably instead of having instant static meshes of a bunch of teeny tiny little meshes, I'm going to have to batch them up into larger chunks, larger wall chunks, and use some other destruction, like perhaps I'll use chaos to fragment the larger wall chunks, and that way I can destroy entire wall chunks at a single time, while still having all of these individual particles scattered about. But that's beside the point. That'll be a later project. For now, um, I'm going to dive into how I have set all of this stuff up. All right, so all of this begins with a PCG graph. I'll just call this PCG example. And I don't need to do much to make this work, just to get landscape data, surface sampler, surface sampler. I'll transform these points to move them up a little bit. Uh, let's just do offset minimax, 100, 100, and then a static mesh spawner. For the static mesh, I'll just add a chamfer cube. And finally, I need to create a target actor. Hook that up to the static mesh's target actor. And the actor I'm going to create is this BP ISM actor, the one that I have right up here. So just uh, drag that into the world, and we've got a few cubes. They're, sliding, they're slightly floating off the ground. That just makes them fly a little better for this example. And then, pew, 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 we can uh, send them flying. All right, so uh, yeah, that's all there is to it. And that's sort of what I've been focusing on with this thing. Just a uh, fire and forget destruction system. All right, let's start off in third person character where everything begins. There are a couple ways that I'm sending data in. Well, all right, let, let's back up a little bit. So what happens is, and I've got all these things up here. Third person character sends an I hit this object command to pool handler. Pool handler tracks all the hits decides whether or not to send or pull data from the ISM, which is housed under the ISM actor here. Uh, the data goes back to pool handler based on what ISM tells it, and then pool handler then spawns Niagara particles accordingly. When the particles die, they, are, they either just go away completely, or they trigger an event on pool handler. Pool handler sees the event, compiles the data of the particle location, and sends that data back to ISM Actor, which then creates a new separate ISM so that um, 
we can't destroy the particles twice. That's just for efficiency purposes. Once we've knocked the particles down, I want them to stay on the ground. And that's, that's about it. So starting off with third-person character, as I said, there are a couple of ways of sending the data in. One is, uh, let's see, this is my right click, right hand. I do some stuff with uh, animating the hand to make sure it raises up. Once it's raised, I enable a boolean that says it can fire. Uh, I check that boolean, and if it's active, I send the data to Niagara to create a beam. On the left hand, this is a one-time shot, and then it resets a timer that then allows it to go off again. And then I trigger trace ray. And so I've been uh, tracing this in the direction of the camera movement. I just have this kind of simple thing to check the follow camera, see where it's facing, rotate it up a little bit so it aims better. And yeah, I send that data into this trace ray command with the start location, which is going to be the hands, uh, right hand, a socket that I've placed on the right hand and the end location, which is the end of the main visibility trace that I've uh, been looking at. And I also plug in the radius, the direction, and the magnitude of the shot. The left-hand beam is about the same, except it's got 150 radius and 7500 magnitude, so it sends things flying farther in a larger radius. Uh, another way I have of sending in data is with on-component BGAM overlap of a collision cylinder. And I don't think I need three of these here. But uh, yeah, this is just a collision cylinder that starts off slightly larger than the player's collision. And I scale it with uh, movement speed. So let's see. Yeah, right here. So just as you're moving faster, the collision cylinder gets bigger. If I collide with something, I call this accept hit, which is actually kind of shortcutting um, into pool handler. And Oh, before I call accept hit, I screen it to make sure it is implementing the destruction blueprint. Otherwise, you know, just filter it out here. Don't bother sending it on over to pool holder. So the reason I'm doing a separate function on this versus the uh, right and left click uh, beams is this one does not batch the hits up. They're all individual hits. And so with the beams, I'm sort of sending it into a, a preprocessor both to draw the beams, but also because the, the um, beams are sphere traces, they return a multi-hit, a, a hit array, and then I'm processing the hit array, and then basically calling this accept hit function within it. Uh, the reason I have two uh, colliders is because I found there was a slight bug with the way I'm interacting with ISMs, if you uh, collide with ISMs, you destroy the ISMs, then they're basically arrays on the indexes. The arrays shuffle up, and I think the collision cylinder then detects, oh, I just collided with you know index zero here, but you shuffled up index zero, so now there's a new index zero. I'm not going to collide with it this frame, and uh, that causes problems. So if I just toggle between the two uh, collision cylinders, that fixes the issue. And I'm just uh, toggling them every every tick, basically. And the last way I have interacting with things is just a trigger to destroy everything. I'm calling it convert everything into nothing. And this just uh, does a simple line trace. doesn't have many protections on it since it's a temporary measure. And I tell it, uh, tell the pool holder, uh, pool handler, to start deleting ISMs, which triggers a process which uh, runs through the entire uh, main holding actor and deletes all the ISMs underneath it and spawns particles cascading down. So back under event graph, I'm going to look at this trace ray command right here. So let's go to that. Just close these out. Okay, so trace ray. I just trigger a multi-sphere trace for objects with the radius uh, and start and end point. I see if there are any hits. If there are, I go through a for each loop on the hit array, and I'm going to check if the actor that I have hit is implementing this BPI ISM interface. 
If it is, I send it on to accept hit, which is what the the uh, collision cylinders are calling. And if it's not, I, I don't. I send in the actor, the hit component, and the hit item. And I've chosen to make the primitive component be sort of the key to everything that I'm doing here. I'm going to be looking up uh, map values based on this primitive component. I'm going to be sending values to the, the Blueprint interface using this hit component, and uh, so on. All right, and then I am choosing to generate a particle with this. I could move this Boolean off to trace ray, but right now I've decided to generate a particle for everything. Um, things would be a little more efficient if I didn't, since that's one less thing to send off to Niagara. So I might eventually add in a Boolean here that then just feeds straight into this generate particle. That's sort of beside the point for now. Uh, full clear is going to be used when I'm fully destroying the building, that thing I mentioned earlier with that uh, other, other command, the clear all thing. And I also pipe in the launch direction and magnitude into this whole thing. Now let's look at the accept hit function. All right, so this function, accept hit, routes based on these two booleans, generate particle and full clear. And really, I could probably make them into an enum, and that would be a little, little more solid. Future project. So first off, anything that I send into this, I add to a pool of dirty actors. I'm going to call on all of these actors later in the tick and tell them to clean everything up. So let's look at if generate particle is set, but full clear is not set. So full clear is not set. We go into this branch. If it is set, well, if it isn't set, we go to a QNO particle and enable timer with hits. QNO particle. Uh, well, let's look at this one first. QNO particle. So that goes into the um, blueprint interface, which is implemented on ISM actor here. And we call, let's close these up. We call Q no particle, which then uh, goes straight into a function process Q no particle. We see if the object is in a um, map that basically tracks whether or not it's active or not. If it's been fully cleared out, it's not active, we don't have to do anything on it. Uh, that's kind of a catch. Well, it, it serves two purposes. One is it makes sure I don't do anything with something that is fully cleared out. Two, I'm using this when I do a full destroy to uh, tear down the entire building. I just set this flag and then we go into the uh, final cleanup phase and destroy everything based on this flag. Okay, so um, if we find it and it's active, we then go into a branch. We see if we've destroyed anything else, this tick. If we have, then there's going to be an entry in queued ISM removal with some instances in it. Uh, if, if we haven't, then that isn't here. We send it down here and just add this, um, this index to a set and add that to indexes to removed. Okay, so, um, if, if this does exist, we then check, does this index already exist here? If it does already exist, do nothing with it, because we don't want a single brick, a single ISM instance, to spawn two different particles. That's just silly. So then if it's made it through, it doesn't already have an entry. We add the entry um, into temp target set. We then add that back to the map, and we're done with it. All right, so uh, process Q with particle right here, Q with particle, back in the ISM actor. Let's close this one. Q with particle. So this one uh, does the same check. See, check if it's active, check if the index already exists. If they don't exist, we're going to find the ISM primitive reference. So this is something... Um, I said that we communicate everything via ISM primitives, but the very start of the ISM actor in the event graph here, I am checking to see 
Well, I'm, I'm doing a little initialization. I've put it on both begin play and tick because I found when I got all the, when I get a lot of these actors, the begin play event doesn't seem to fire off every time or something. I, th there were a bunch of actors that were missing the actions from this begin play event. So I just put it in tick as well. And at the end of it, I just uh, disable tick so it only fires off once. So this basically just, um, finds all primitive components on this actor, checks if it's a PCG generated component. Um, this isn't necessarily necessary, but right now I have built this to be completely based on PCG generated objects. If you want to do a hand place object, I, I could add a separate tag check in there for it or adapt this in some other way. Anyways, uh, here is where we cast it to an instant static mesh component. So we're just doing it once at the start and we're adding the primitive to ISM map right here. So this is, this map is what converts the primitive reference to an ISM reference that we can then do something with. We add the, yes, it's active. Uh, we add a ISM component. This component is going to be handling the objects that come back to rest once they're destroyed. And I could batch these components up into a larger batch and just have fewer um, destroyed ISMs than I have uh, destructible ISMs, but this ensures that it's an easy way of making sure that I don't let my ISMs get too big. The, the counterpoint is it keeps them ridiculously small, so there's definitely efficiencies to be added here. I then do some initialization on this ISM component and I add it to its own list of the initial primitive reference to this ISM component because we don't need to track this ISM component's primitive. Everything is going to be referring to the base ISM component's primitive and then we'll just basically intercept that based on the function and return this new ISM. Okay, back under... Let's see, what are we under? Q with particle. Here we go. So, um, yeah, ISM primitive reference. We look that up. We get the instance transform from it. We add this to indexes to remove and return the location, rotation x vector, and scale. Uh, it's the rotation x vector because the way I'm sending it into Niagara, it wants the rotation X vector. Niagara doesn't seem to work very well with uh, rotators. Okay, so if we don't find the ISM primitive reference, uh, just return zero, basically error out. It means something was initialized incorrectly or somehow the data got routed incorrectly. So just don't do anything. And let's see back here. Uh, this is basically this, this true route is basically a similar result as the route on Q with no particle, where if it already exists, we break this apart, check if it already exists in there and either feed it or don't feed it out based on whether or not it exists. Okay, back to pool handler. So this return node returns the data to pool handler. And then I'm adding it to uh, Niagara start location, rotation scale. I'm calculating the velocity based on this inbound launch direction and magnitude. That just directly translates to, well, magnitude just directly translates to velocity. But I'm uh, scaling the magnitude either plus or minus 50%. I'm adjusting the angle that's going in a little bit as well, just to add a little chaos to everything. Uh, for the angular velocity, the rotation, I'm just basically saying rotate it either negative or positive up to uh, a full rotation per second in every direction. Then I am getting the ISM and mesh index, which I'm going to be passing into the Niagara array. The mesh index is going to tell the Niagara um, array, well, the Niagara system, what 
mesh to use. And the ISM primitive tells it, um, well, it, it just saves that. And then when it destroys itself, it outputs the ISM primitive back again. And then pool handler knows which ISM to add the data back to. And those are here. And then I'll enable a timer for hits. So um, let me take a quick look at enable timer for hits, and then we'll back up and look at ISM and mesh index. All right, enable timer for hits just checks, is their timer active? If not, set a timer next tick, and then set the timer to that timer that we've just set. And the reason I do this is because I've found that if you just do set timer next tick multiple times in a tick, it'll fire off once <laughs> per time you called this. It's different from just setting a regular timer over time. The regular timer over time works by detecting that the event has a timer and uh, resetting the timer every time. So slightly different behaviors based on how you're setting the timer. And this is my way of making sure I only call this function next tick once. Uh, now that I've gone into here, I'm going to put off run deletions for actors and look back at this, get ISM and mesh index. So this takes the actor and the ISM primitive. And it takes them and sees, have we already processed this? If so, let's just return the ISM and mesh index. If not, we call return mesh from BP ISM and return mesh just uh, grabs the ISM primitive reference that we created on initialization and returns that, well, returns the uh, static mesh back in pool handler. So now we've got the static mesh. We're going to use it a little bit later. Since indexed ISM, uh, since ISM primitive didn't have this in a map, we know that we can add it freely to this index to ISM array, which is tracking um, the ISM basically synchronized with this map. And this allows us to uh, convert an index to the ISM because uh, the index is going to correspond to the array um, index. All right, so we've added that. And then we check to see if mesh to index already has an entry. And we have to do this separately because, you know, even if we have 500 ISMs, they might have the same mesh. So there are going to be fewer meshes than there are ISMs. So we find mesh to index, see if that exists. If it does, uh, we're nearly done. We just um, skip this and add the ISM primitive to index right here because we're done. We don't have to do anything with the mesh. If the mesh doesn't exist, well, then we have to um, add it to index to mesh. I'm going to calculate the mesh extents because I had problems calculating the mesh extents dynamically in Niagara. So this mesh extents is going to be a reference uh, array in Niagara as well. Um, add this little mesh index entry, which we then check here to make sure it already existed. And then I have two different Niagara arrays that are processing particles. The particles that they're generating should be exactly the same based on the uh, index that I sent into them. So I'm setting the mesh extents on these things. And this mesh extents is just growing over time. So if I sent uh, 50 meshes in, I should have 50 different mesh extents entries. And that's why I just add it to a um, variable and not a local variable, because this needs to grow over time and stay the same. OK, so next I set the static mesh variable for both of these. And I'm just calling it mesh. Um, and then the index number, so it'll mesh 0, mesh 1, mesh 2, up through mesh uh, 15 is, or 14. I think mesh 14 is the max one I've created so far. If I have a map with more than 15 meshes at a time, I might want to create more mesh variables. Uh, we'll get to that later, though. All right, and then let's see. Uh, I just select whether or not it was a newly created mesh or not and feed that back into ISM index and mesh index. We return those, and that is our 
reference of ISM that we're going to be feeding into Niagara and the mesh that we're going to be feeding into Niagara. The mesh triggers an actual result in Niagara. The ISM just comes back afterwards. All right, so back in accept hit. Next, we enable timer for hits, which then goes into run deletions on actors. And this function here, we uh, convert our dirty actors, which we were setting earlier in accept hits, uh, right up here. We convert our dirty actors to an array, run through the array, uh, send remove queued items to each actor in the array, and the ism actor remove queued items. That uh, checks to make sure that we have triggered some indexes to remove. If we do, and this is probably unnecessary, it's just a little safety. If we do have them, we convert uh, the primitive components to a key, and on each different ism primitive that's been um, checked, we see if it's active, if it uh, has been set to false, which I haven't really covered how that would happen yet. But if it's been set to false, we just uh, run through everything. We clear all the ISMs, uh, set a delete timer to trigger it. Well, we set a delete timer to trigger the clear the next frame, so we'll come back to that later. If we do find that it's active, then we are going to break the amount of instances that we're moving, make sure that they're not empty. If they are not empty, we see if the length of this set is equal to the total instances. If it is, that means we're removing every single instance, and we can just do clear instances, which just says wipe out this array of instances. If not, I'm going to convert the set to an array and send the array into remove instances on the ISM component, which removes specific instances. And when all that's done, uh, I'm clearing indexes to remove, and I'm done with that. Um, since I'm here, let's just look into how this full delete works. So full delete, we have added this entry to ISMs to clear for each ism that we're going to be triggering a full delete on and full delete is just right here everything in isms to clear we're clearing the instances and this basically puts this clear off to the next tick i'll cover why that is when we uh, get around to actually looking at this looking at what triggered it all right back under pool handler once we've removed the queued items, we do preprocess Niagara arrays. So preprocess Niagara arrays. It does two different things. Um, the first one is the path we've been looking at. The second one is the path we've not been looking at. So I'll cover this one later, but it's essentially the same. So uh, this data is when we're generating a particle without doing a full clear, which basically is generating a particle with collision. The full clear generates a particle without collision. So generating a particle with collision, we make sure that we have had some entries. Uh, we've set Niagara start location. If not, well, the only other way that this will have been called in is setting the destruction with no collision, right? Anyways, uh, so yeah, if, if the start location has had something added to it, which we do back under accept hit here, so we accept the hit and we add to start location, etc., etc., which is how we got to here. So we do for each loop on Niagara start location. Really doesn't matter which one of these we do it on. Um, I'm just kind of using start location as the base key. We... Um, We've set all the mesh indexes, so I'm going to change this index to a mesh, uh, get the bounds, which technically uh, I could just get the bounds from here, from mesh extents, instead of getting the bounds that way, but that's another lookup table. So uh, yeah, I'm just getting the bounds a second time. Maybe it's more efficient to get it from the uh, thing that I already got it from. Anyways, uh, getting back to the box extent, we're checking the scale that we sent in, multiplying that by the bounds to find the actual current size. 
Uh, I'm just multiplying the size by two, uh, blah, 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 blah. Basically, this is a lot of stuff to figure out the uh, start location of the prediction and the radius. The launch velocity is going to be, um, well, just the <laughs> launch velocity. Plug that on in. And I'm doing this predict projectile path advanced to see how far the object is going to fly without colliding with anything. And so this lets me determine how long the particle is going to be going before I turn on collision. Once I hit the um, time that it's going to collide at, I turn on collision, and then the particle itself gets a lot less efficient. So this allows me to delay that um, lack of efficiency for a little bit and just have the particles fly through the air, not worrying about what they're hitting until uh, they get to a point where they're going to hit something. I am using uh, Projectile Path Advanced because I found that the lifetime calculation seems to be more accurate in this one than it does with other projectile paths. So I'm finding the last index, finding what time it um, impacts at, subtracting 0 0.05 seconds, so it pulls it back a little bit just before collision, uh, making sure that we send at least 0 0.01 for the lifetime as opposed to a negative value, and then adding that to a lifetime array, which corresponds to every single particle we've created. If uh, it doesn't hit anything, I'm just going to set the lifetime to 30. It happens occasionally, but not too often. Uh, and then the max sim time I've set to 30, because, well, these pro projectiles probably won't be flying for 30 seconds. If they do, then the few that last for 30 seconds, turning on collision after 30 seconds, shouldn't be that much of a hit on performance. Okay, so uh, now we've created all of the arrays necessary to feed data into Niagara. We send a set Niagara collision. So this is sending the values into the Niagara system that has collision enabled. So for this, I'm using a Niagara data channel. Uh, I've switched over to using lifetime as the key rather than start location because, I, I don't know, I'm a little inconsistent here. <laughs> Uh, I build the search parameters based on the root component. Uh, doesn't really matter though because this is a uh, data channel that is, let's see, uh, Niagara, NDC, which one is this one? Physical objects from BP underscore collision, this one here. So this data channel is a global data channel which means there's only going to be one data channel. It also means, though, that the data I'm feeding into it, the ISM data and mesh data that I've been uh, sending in, well, the mesh data and the bounds data that I've been sending in, are going to be used from the Niagara array that I've predefined. So that's why I'm using that instead of islands. Islands themselves seem to be um, created based on the base Niagara um, system that's uh, defined here as opposed to the one that I've been updating. So I'm sending in position, rotation, scale, linear and angular velocity, the mesh index, the lifetime, and then the ISM index isn't actually used in the Niagara system, but it will be sent out afterwards. And I'm keeping the previous frame data. Everything I'm doing here is going to be working on the previous frame, which means there's a slight delay on getting the data into Niagara. Okay, back under here, the data we're sending into Niagara. Um, the Niagara sim I'm using for this, for the one with collision, I'm only doing a CPU sim. Uh, and that's because it's going to be calling an event to pass the data back to um, the pool handler. And calling that event only works in CPU sim. I'm hoping next patch will enable a way to pass the data back with GPU, in which case I can uh, make it a GPU sim instead, which I think will be a little more efficient. All right, so I have 
triggered the data channel. Then I'm going to activate the um, component right here, bool and ISM, and that's the one that's picking up the data from this data channel. Uh, and this is only necessary if the component has gone to sleep. Uh, if it's already awake, this basically doesn't do anything. So I'm not checking reset on this. All right, then I do a for each loop on Niagara Lifetime. I'm going to write all of these data points, uh, lifetime, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all the way to the ISM index into the data channel. And then I just uh, clear all of these arrays. Uh, this one, the start rotation, I'm converting it over to a quaternion, which actually in that case I should probably not be setting start rotation to the x vector. I should be, uh, this should be a rotator. All right, well, that's, that's probably a bug, meaning these Things might be starting off in the wrong rotation. I'll have to check that later. Okay, so then, um, oh yeah, I invalidate the Niagara timer handle, which I'm not sure I'm actually using right now. Back in, yeah, so now we're sending the data to Niagara. Okay, so now we can step over to Niagara. This one is, let's see, bool and ISM. It's using NDC bool and ISM right here. So this setup is a basic data channel setup. Um, it's looping infinite. It's completing if unused. CPU sim, I have set the bounds to be fixed because I had some issues where if they're dynamic and I look away from the emitter, the emitter goes away. So I'm just making it really big for now. Let's see, what else? I uh, call this spawn from NDC scratch pad. I'm just getting the NDC reader, set the min and max spawn count to the spawn count, which is, um, I believe, just one for everything. Yeah, I'm just spawning a single particle per entry in the NDC. Let's see, then I trigger a read from NDC, which is this. It gets all of the data right here and just sends it on in uh, it sets the output and um, there's a, a guide on how to do this. It's a pretty basic guide, but it kind of walks you through what all these things are doing and I will link it in the description. So back under the system, I'm initializing the particle based on my various NDC values. I'm setting the mesh orientation based on the rotation adding velocity based on the linear velocity, same with rotational velocity, and I have a scratch pad here to initialize a variable enable collision, setting it to blank, or setting this boolean to off. I'm also doing a little cheat where I calculate when the particle is created which axis it's going to be coming to rest on. And based on this random integer that calculates the axis, I then set the radius to the equivalent uh, axis of the mesh bounds. And this mesh bounds is the array that I set earlier um, in the ch -ch -ch -ch, this get index and mesh index for ISM. So that's where this is getting used. And um, that basically lets me cheat and make the objects come to rest on the proper axis. Without this, uh, they would just fly in the air, come to rest in the ground. Uh, so basically, if, if I have a rectangle, then I, the mesh bounds I'm calculating it might be too small for the longer length of the rectangle or it might be too big for the shorter length of the rectangle, but it doesn't matter because when the objects come to rest, they come to rest in the correct location based on the uh, bounds that I've piped in. I guess this divided by two is unnecessary here. All right, so yeah, and then I'm just setting another variable. Is it aligning on X, Y, or Z? All right, uh, then we are initializing the ISM, which is setting the ISM input to the particle input here. The ISM input is just this output, read from NDC, ISM index. 
Okay, uh, enable flags after lifetime. When we've hit the normalized age, the end of normalized age, which is 0 to 1, we enable collision. Boom, enable collision. Uh, particle state, I'm just setting it to uh, unlimited, don't kill particles when lifetime. Gravity force, drag, etc. Uh, collision. So we're checking if enable collision is set, and enable collision is set by this enable flags after lifetime. When its lifetime is at an end, we enable collision. So if collision is enabled, we're doing all these collision calculations. Uh, particle radius is going to be this target radius, which I set under find target axis. So uh, yeah, this this takes into account the radius that we just set. And then some bounce functions to make sure it slows down and comes to rest pretty quickly. Uh, assault forces. So this right here, align particles with collision plane, this is sort of based on the collision and the radius that we set along with the align on x, y, or z. So we're only allowing alignment on one of these axes. And that axis corresponds with the particle radius, which corresponds to the extent of that axis. So the only axis it is allowed to come to rest on is the one where the radius matches that axis, which is a way of faking the final resting point so it doesn't look weird, doesn't clip into the ground as much. Let's see, and then everything else here is basically default. Uh, I've tweaked the rate of alignment a little bit to something that appears good and seems to work. Uh, I have this scratch pad now. When the particles are going slow enough and their age is over at least 0 0.05, um, that ensures that a particle doesn't spawn and immediately um, stop and die, which basically helps keep particles from clipping into anything. Anyways, uh, if the velocity is slow enough, if the angular velocity is slow enough, uh, if the position is less than negative 5,000, I just kill it off. Um, and if it is colliding with something, then we uh, kill the particle. All right, so once the particle is dead, we generate a death event, and this right here is why this has to be CPU sim. I think that eventually GPU sim will be able to write to an NDC, but right now that isn't working quite right. I am hoping 5.4 will fix that. I then export the particle data in two separate batches because I have way too much particle go data going out for a single batch. And so I've basically taken this export uh, particle position and rotation and uh, made my own uh, modules from it. So this one I believe is default. I'm just exporting um, position and let's see, what else? Uh, nothing, just position. But uh, position and rotation XYZ, I'm also outputting the ISM. So if we look at this, I'm getting the unique ID from it, da, 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 and adding point 0.2 to it. So unique ID plus point 0.2, I'm indicating that this is the first of the exports. And yeah, I'm sending out position, size, velocity. Size is going to be the unique particle ID plus uh, point 0.2. And this one. I'm doing the same thing, unique particle ID, but this one is 0.5. Actually, this should be 0.8, just for uh, safety purposes. Let's fix that now. And I'm uh, just hijacking everything here. Uh, mesh ID is going to be in the velocity Y. Uh, velocity Z is the W vector of mesh orientation, and so on. I've just, yeah, outputting random... Uh, things to this. <laughs> uh, compile and apply and save. There we go. And uh, yeah, last setup. So that's all the export. Last setup is the mesh render. So the mesh render itself, I've set up with 15 meshes. Uh, for slight debugs, I'm purposes, I'm setting mesh zero as this chamfer cube. 
but meshes 1 and on are all blank. They are drawing from this mesh parameter, mesh 0, 1, 2, 3, and I have those as user parameters, and I'm setting those user parameters, mesh 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., within this pool handler, mesh 0, etc., etc., to an actual mesh. So uh, all of this is done calculated on the fly um, every time you launch the game or load into the map. Which means that uh, it's set up to be completely agnostic of whatever you build, it'll just handle it as long as you've enabled the Blueprint interface on the ISM. And that's that. This export is handled by Pool Handler. In the event graph, at the start, I set up event return particle data, and I have it set up to accept these events, and then it's going to assemble the received Niagara data based on this data that comes through. So assemble received particle data. The particle data is providing us position, size, and velocity. I'm going to take everything that's been input to us, break it to an array, and I am checking if this size value, which is um, the particle ID plus a value that indicates if it's uh, well, basically, which Niagara array it is a part of. So if it is like 1.2, 2.2, etc., 0.2 is less than 0.3, which means it's Niagara 1 of 2, which is containing position and rotation. If it's not that, it means it contains the, the, the time, the scale, the ISM, etc., etc. And the ID we're only outputting so that we can match up this data with um, between both of these different exports. So it's basically just the unique reference um, that allows us to pair up the data later. Because we need to do two exports, we need a way to make sure the exports actually match. So these exports are just uh, making up this big uh, struct that contains all the data that's going to be exported. And I'm building it up, and I am increasing the count on it when count is 2. Uh, we pass the data out. So if count is 0 or 1, we know that we don't have the full set of data. If it's 2, we know that we've processed both of these uh, exports. We have all the data, we can then output it. Uh, and we're going to take the cute particle data, break it apart, uh, convert it over to a transform value, and create a new ISM with that transform. And then we make sure to uh, send it to the correct ISM based on this queued mesh transforms value that we're sending out here. And queued mesh transforms is using the mesh index. Right, uh, so that's a little misleading. I am taking the. I'm calling this mesh index, but on the Boolean ISM, let's see what I'm actually outputting in the mesh index. I'm outputting the. Ah, right. I'm outputting ISM, so that's, uh, yeah, shouldn't be mesh ID, this should be ISM ID. Let's rename that here. Rename, this will be ISM ID. I'll save that. All right, so ISM ID is being output here. Then under pool handler, we still have this mesh index. So let's, uh, what is this? S queued particle data ISM. 
Uh, S cubed particle data ISM. Here we go, S cubed particle data ISM. So let's change this to be named ISM index. Save that. And back under pool handler, we've got ISM index and ISM index. Back under assembled uh, received particle data, ISM index is going to queued mesh transforms. Queued mesh transforms should be called queued ISMs. Queued ISMs. There we go. Okay, so yeah, we add this to a list of queued ISMs, and then we run through this list of queued ISMs afterwards and make sure the length is over zero, get the keys, and get the ISM from this indexed ISM array we built earlier in this uh, get ISM and mesh index data. And we send the transforms on over to the ISM. And then we clear it out. The ISM takes add to ISM under ISM actor here, add to ISM, and just does a batch add of instances to this backup ISM primitive reference, which is the ISM that we created earlier to mirror every PCG created ISM, but without collision. And um, that's about all of it. So that's everything with the main destruction. The only thing to run through is, uh, let's see, this thing right here, convert everything to nothing. So when I hit my railgun button, which is R, it destroys the entire building. I just checked to see if I've hit the building, and if I have, and the actor that I've hit, implements the BPI ISM interface, I send a note off to pool handler to delete everything. It, well, double checks that it implements the interface, which is unnecessary, but uh, that's all right, it doesn't happen very often. Gets the parent actor, and so what I've done here is, um, right here. So I'm creating this target actor off of everything, uh, off of the PCG, but so I get the parent actor, which is this PCG example, and then I find all the child actors, BP ISM actor, and um, that's uh, right here, find the child actors, get attached actors to the parent actor. And then I'm setting a timer by event. This speed I'm doing it at is a lot of trial and error to figure out what the fastest I can destroy these things is. Uh, 0.3, I believe, is 1 divided by 30. Yep, so every 30th of a second, I am triggering this event, which then sends clears to ISMs, and that's right here. I run through the amount of ISMs that I've configured right here. Uh, in this case, it's only one, so this for loop is completely unnecessary, but I could increase it to 2, I could increase it to 10, I could just do it on everything and not even worry about this. Uh, but I found that one ISM, one full ISM clear every 30th of a second works pretty well for my system. I check if that actor implements the interface, I get its PCG generated components, and I send in an accept hit with full clear set. So accept hit with full clear goes straight through to, let's see, uh, full clear, true, right up here, Q full clear with particle. That in here, uh, Q full clear with particle, just basically it's like the other clears that we've got, except um, I am running through all of the instances and returning all of those, adding them to an array and returning them to the pool handler, well, whatever called it in this case, pool handler, once I've gone through all of the instances. I do double check that the um, instance I'm returning doesn't already exist in this uh, queued ISM removal thing. 
Okay. So we're, we return these instances here. We do the get ISM and mesh index, and this is basically the same as the other process. Um, but we are going to send it in to a separate place. So I'll, I'll just skip ahead since everything's basically the same until we get to pre-process Niagara arrays. So this is where we separate here. We're going with the GPU, which uh, I should rename to probably no collision, but for now it's GPU. We're calculating all of these values exactly the same as above here, except here we are projecting based on world static and dynamic, and here we're only doing world static. And I've made sure that I set all of my ISMs as world dynamic. I could create a new trace channel for them, but for now, uh, this is separating them all. So this is just going to do the trace, ignore all of the pre-created ISMs, and just have the particles fly on through the ground until they die. And through the ground, I'm actually adding a little time to them, as opposed to subtracting, which I do up here, so that they do go full fully through the ground before they die. And then I set Niagara no collision. And unlike the previous one, I'm not using the data channel. I've got this set up just for uh, future patch versions when it gets updated. But I am setting an array on all of these that is directly setting the array within NS array building destruction. And then I call activate after I've updated all of the arrays to make it process in a single burst. So this is um, just loading initialized particle is select float from array, select position from array, and so on. And the value that I'm selecting from the array is just the particle unique ID. Uh, the unique IDs basically increment uh, contiguously, so it really doesn't matter where in the array I set. Even if the array is 0 to 100 and particles are 100 to 200, I'm going to create one particle per entry in the array, so it just works regardless of where it wraps. Uh, spawn burst instantaneous. I am setting the amount of objects I'm spawning based on the count of values in the array that I'm sending in. So this is all handled automatically. I do the mesh orientation, velocity, etc. Basically the same as the NDC, but in this case I'm just setting it from an array. Uh, particle state, etc. And this is a lot simpler because I'm just killing the objects when the lifetime expires. And I'm using an array on this because I want to use GPU particles, and the array is the only way I can uh, feed the data into the GPU. I've tried out a data channel, but for the GPU in 5.3, the data channel is limited to eight particles, which is great when you're spawning a burst of particles, like from a um, wall impact or something. You know, a single wall impact, great. Burst tons of particles off of that impact. But when you're spawning you know, 300 plus particles every frame, limiting it to eight doesn't work. I need individual control over each of the particles, which is why I'm spawning them from array. And that's that's everything. Um, I back under pool handler, just loop through every single um, ISM that I've sent in, clear them all. When I'm done with that, I just invalidate the timer and that's everything. And just for fun, here's me taking down the entire thing at once, 848,000 particles. If you see anything that you think I could improve on, please let me know. I always love hearing about how I could improve my technique. All right, bye.